My name is Malcolm Hoare, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Ray Lahart and Alex Cobalt. Ray is the portfolio manager on our real estate fund, and many of you have met him on previous calls and webinars. Also on the call, as I mentioned, is Alex Cobalt, our head of equity research within our asset management team. Alex will be speaking to us on one of our mega themes, namely aging, and then Ray will pick that up and discuss its applicability within his portfolio. The presentation will last approximately 40 minutes and there will be time for questions at the end. Please use the chat functionality if you'd like to put a question through during the course of the presentation. And at the end, I will read it out and the portfolio managers will answer. May I also just ask you that your mics please be on mute and your cams off just to try and get the best possible voice quality coming through. My role this morning is just to do a quick introduction and then hand over to Ray, who will be doing most of the speaking and take you through our agenda. Most of you know Saracen and Partners. You've been supportive of our funds over many years. So firstly, a very big thank you to all of you. And as I said, just to give you a quick update, at the end of last year, our staff complement within the firm was 223 people, of which 89 are investment professionals. At the end, we had 17 billion pounds in assets under management, which is the highest. And so we've weathered the, the COVID pandemic and the resulting crisis in the market rather well. As you well know as well, local management own a significant portion of the equity of the firm and we have a diversified global client base. About 46% of our business is made up of our charities and endowment side, putting us in the top three managers for UK charities and really helping us to take the lead on ESG stewardship and responsible investing that continues to become a greater and greater part of the investment landscape. The rest is split between institutional and professional clients including wealth planning, intermediaries, and their clients, such as yourselves in our retail funds. The remainder is managed by our private clients for their high and ultra high net worth individuals and families. Just to remind you of Saracen and Partners, we're a specialized investment boutique in the heart of London with a distinct thematic equity process. We integrate and embed ESG and stewardship throughout this process, and we're responsible owners of capital with an ownership mindset aligned to that of our clients, and we truly do invest for the long term. My final slide is just to quickly show you visually the relationship between Saracen Partners and J. Safra Saracen Group. With the partnership, the local management owns 36% of the economic interest in the partnership, and the remainder is owned by Bank J. Safra Saracen, a long established Swiss private bank founded in 1841. Ray naturally engages with his colleagues at the bank on a number of levels, primarily regarding the sustainable nature of the stocks with which he holds in his fund. And he will expand on that in due course. So thank you to all of you for joining us again. Thank you to Ray. Thank you to Alex. If I could hand over to you now, Ray, to continue with the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm, and uh, good morning, everybody. I've switched off my uh, video to avoid uh, breaking up. Um, to continue from uh, what uh, Malcolm said, um, on, specifically on the real estate uh, fund, Saracen has been the, one of the first European real estate uh, funds. We started the fund, my predecessors did, back in 2004. And the fund is different from its peers because it's a very much a Saracen fund, which means that we are global, we are sustainable, and we are thematic. We will discuss that a bit later on. Um, where we're also different is that we do most of the work in-house, but we have a close cooperation with Jones Lang LaSalle, who provides us with direct market research and gives us access to all their offices when we, where we can go to, when we can go to their offices again, hopefully in the future. Um, where we can talk to management teams and have more information on the direct market. So the team, you've seen this slide before, Ben and I myself manage the fund on a day-to-day -day basis. But very important for, for us, for the fund, is that the broad 
uh, number or the large number of thematic analysts that we uh, that we have uh, within Saracen. Today we we will discuss the aging team, which is normally covered by Alex Hunter, who will who unfortunately couldn't make it uh, today, but who is now replaced by Alex Cobalt, uh, who also who's the head of research, but also is involved on a day to day thinking about aging as a team. And um, we will do that in a similar way as we did last time when we discussed the digitalization uh, uh, team, where we talk about the theme in general and then how we use that theme in our real estate fund. Uh, the agenda of the day, similar as last uh, times, um, we will start with a review of the last quarter. Then we will discuss how we are different in our approach. Uh, as mentioned, Alex Cobalt will discuss the theme of aging. We will then have a, a, a topic of confirming the case for global listed real estate. I thought it might be useful to, to take a step back and look at global listed real estate for diversified portfolio as we go into 2021. And we will end with the outlook for listed real estate for this year. But to start with the review of last quarter, or last year. It was obviously a quite an eventful uh, year. We started Q1 with a big drop when COVID became a global pandemic. Real estate dropped quite severely, more so than general equity. We saw more divergence, uh, divergence in returns in the second quarter when investors started to realize that not all the real estate sectors are hurt the same way um, where retail REITs are obviously suffering from the lockdowns that we see and a lot of tenants not being able to pay their rents or closing a shop. There are other sectors like the industrial sector and the data centers who are actually profiting from the increased online shopping and the increased working from home. The, the summer months were actually quite boring, so to speak, where we did not see a lot of uh, newsworthy events up until November when the vaccine rally started in mid-November and we had a strong end of the year. But as you can see, there's still a big gap between general equity and listed equity. Uh, that gap has <clears throat> uh, grown over the last couple of uh, years. That's also the reason why I thought it might be useful to review the case for listed real estate in a diversified portfolio. So focusing on the last quarter, um, everything you see here uh, was a result of the vaccine uh, rally. We are structurally underweight the retail and the hospitality sectors because we believe that they are structurally challenged, but they did quite well uh, in the last quarter um, with retail REITs going up in double digit numbers, which obviously hurt us on relative terms. So although the fund was up 4.3% for the quarter, we still underperformed the benchmark. As you can see, the, the positives were few and far between. We had some European retail, which did well, but unfortunately our structural underweight in US retail and hotels hurt us, as did our overweight in digitalization and the industrial REITs, two sectors that did very well up until the vaccine rally, but obviously were left behind in the value rally that we saw in the last weeks of the year. So that on the, on the, on the quarter, uh, now for a second part, um, let me introduce you Alex Cobbles. He is the head of research at, uh, at Saracen. He works closely with Alex Hunter, who, as I mentioned, unfortunately was unable to make it, who is the team specialist on aging. But Alex Cobbles will run you through um, our, our thinking on that theme and how we implement uh, the benefits of aging into our real estate portfolios. Alex? <laughs> Thank you, Ray, and um, good day to everyone. Again, I'll keep my camera off just in terms of bandwidth. Um, as you'll be aware, and, and as already been mentioned, Saf, uh, Saracen does differentiate itself, I think, in two ways. Firstly and foremost, we are a sustainable investor. So we evaluate and embed ESG and our ownership discipline and engagement into our entire investment universe. And, and uh, real estate is, is a part of that. Secondly, with thematic, We've identified multi-decade growth trends and disruptive forces that support GDP plus growth rates through cycles. We think this avoids the siloed of 
group approach of our competitors who tend to focus on MSCI defined categories or regions. Uh, we believe it builds idiosyncratic stock conviction, convic uh, conviction rather. It avoids groupthink, momentum investing, and, and high portfolio turnover. So as Ray has mentioned, many of you have listened, I think, to my colleagues present previously on the topic of sustainability, but also on one of our five bigger themes, digitalization. So over the next five minutes, I'm going to address aging and its implications for the property sector. So perhaps if we could push the next slide. Saracen's not unique in identifying aging as a theme um, that's going to drive multi-decade transformation of many sectors of our economy and society. But what I want to sketch out in the next few slides is that the pace and shape of aging and how we then tackle and identify niches which will be best positioned to lever from this growth in aging and lifetime healthcare. Um, this chart shows that aging is in fact a relatively recent phenomena. Until about 150 years ago, life expectancy was roughly the same as it was back in 1000 AD. So it's only with the industrialization of leading economies of the period that brought with it improved knowledge, technical advancement, et cetera, political structures that improved and extended human existence. It's perhaps alarming that despite some segments of the scientific community suggesting that the first human who will live to a thousand years old is actually alive today, the life expectancy of adult males in the US peaked in 2017, perhaps temporarily, but at 80 years, and now currently is declined down to 78.6. So ageing and healthcare is a perpetual theme. On the next slide, Ray, we've got a sequence of slides that show the evolution through from today through 2050 um, and through to 2010, uh, sorry, 2100 of the world's increasing population. You'll see currently it stands at about 600 million. That's roughly 8% of the global population. By 2050, that doubles to being almost 18% of the population. The next slide shows that perhaps a little bit more graphically. Um, what we're showing here is the UN data that moves from, as I say, uh, today through 2050 and 2100. And there are a few points to highlight from this chart. Firstly, several countries even now are facing the challenging de demographic impediments to growth. You'll see most of Europe or parts of Europe and particularly Japan, as we know well know, However, most of those are developed nations which were able to industrialize and build a societal infrastructure that were better prepared for aging dependence. Secondly, by 2050, which I think is on the next tab, we'll see more countries becoming red. And this signifies greater than 20% of their domestic population being over 65 years old. Noticeably, this includes China, as well as some nations who arguably haven't had the time to develop the optimal infrastructure to care for an aging society. And by 2100, the UN predicts that over a third of the global population will be over 65, with Africa, India, and Asia Minor being the exceptions. On the next slide, we can see what that impact has on aging on the state spend. Since 1950s, healthcare costs in the US have increased, increased dramatically. In fact, it's risen 31 fold in the last four decades on a per capita basis. It's rising now at a rate of roughly 5% per annum, so a much faster rate than US GDP. And that's a structural problem which successive US governments have struggled to address. The next slide illustrates the same sort of quantum, perhaps more starkly, showing that the exceptional growth in the OECD world at 3% is outstripped by the growth necessary in the non OCD world at 6%. And although that may average at 4%, you'll also notice, although the slide is quite small, and I apologize for the smallness of the numbers, but all through that period in comparison of OECD and non-OECD, the absolute figures of OECD health spend, which actually still only uh, attends to the needs of 40% of the global population, is still twice that of the non-OECD healthcare spend. So it's important when we come to investment decisions, investment opportunities to evaluate and uh, differentiate between those two factors, the exceptional growth rate in non-OECD healthcare versus OECD, but at the other end, the exceptional absolute levels of OECD healthcare spend. 
if we move on to the next slide, we'll show, um, I think it's quite an interesting slide. It's from Stiefel and it measures the index household spending since 1959. Now, I mean, looking at that, I've, I do find that some of the data indexation might have its flaws uh, as the trend in taxes and utility spends, uh, certainly nowhere near my own personal experiences. Um, but the trend and the marked divergence of healthcare costs, which is that yellow line, relative to all other, all other expenditures is irrefutable. So I think we've set the, the sort of format in terms of establishing firmly that aging is a valid multi-decade growth theme. And it's probably now time to get a bit more granular and bring it back to the property sector. So on the next slide, this illustrates on a global basis how the annual $10 trillion spend, so roughly 10%, well, actually a little bit more, 12% of global GDP spent on healthcare is divided between assets, labor, and materials. Looking at this donut chart, we can probably say that around two thirds of that pie, we could leave to our equity colleagues who identify the winning drug formulations, the insurers, the distributors, care suppliers, et cetera. But that still leaves roughly one third, about $3 trillion per year, which is dependent on assets to exist, whether they be hospitals, senior housing, critical dependency care units, nursing homes, specialist offices, and laboratories for pharma and biotech companies and, and the like. All these are functions which the real estate, in which the real estate is mission critical. And as such, often is highly specialized and regulated. And for us, we believe that not only provides thematic growth, but presents moated investment opportunities where insights into understanding the competitive landscape, the local politics, all the way down to company strategy are critical to picking the thematic net winners. And on that note, I'll uh, pass back to Ray, who probably build on that and show how it shares some of those thematic ideas and percolate through down to the winners in the portfolio. Over to you, Ray. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, healthcare real estate is about 8.6% of the, of the fund at the moment. And as Alex alluded to, there's a wide variety of real estate assets uh, within the healthcare uh, sector. At the moment, we are a bit worried about the senior housing part. You will have seen that the vacancy in senior housing facilities has increased quite substantially. Uh, obviously, that is in part due to the involuntary move outs due to COVID and because people are a bit hesitant to move their parents or grandparents in senior housing facilities at the moment uh, in this COVID uh, world. So we're on the wait uh, there. But we are very positive on the MOB, so the medical office buildings. That is uh, office buildings specifically designed and spec'd out for pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, and laboratories, et cetera. There's a great demand for those, and we see a strong value uplift and rental uplift in those uh, sectors. So in total, 8.6% of the funds. At the moment, we own Alexandria, Health Peak Properties, and Well Tower, all three of which are in the US. So that on our thematic team of uh, aging, um, I thought it might be useful to confirm the case for global listed real estate again, to see how, what place it uh, has earned in uh, diversified portfolios. And why? Because obviously listed real estate has done poorly last, uh, last year, uh, down about 10%. But I think it's important to note that there was a big uh, divergence in returns between different sectors. Um, you see the returns over uh, in, uh, on the left-hand side on the specific countries uh, and on the right-hand side on the sectors. Uh, on the left-hand side, the countries is less relevant because that negative return in France is mostly a reflection of the fact that most REITs in France are retail orientated and the strong return in Germany is mostly a reflection of the strong return in the residential sector which is mostly uh, the German market. But looking at the sectors, you see hotel and retail, no surpri not surprisingly, did very poorly last, uh, last year. Um, that is including the vaccine rally uh, towards the end of the year. 
but still the sector did, did, did poorly, whereas industrial did quite well and residential held up quite uh, uh, okay as well. Looking at the longer term, um, you will see that normally, you know, quote unquote normally, real estate does relatively well, almost uh, always, in uh, 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 more than half of the uh, 20 year period, ending in the top three um, uh, sectors uh, compared to large cap, small caps, uh, physical real estate, uh, etc. But the last couple of years have been not so uh, good. And you saw that in the first slide that I showed that the gap between general equity and uh, real estate or REITs has uh, opened up uh, a bit. So reviewing the case for listed real estate in a diversified uh, portfolio. Well, first and foremost, that's obviously the track record. And even though the last few years were um, less strong as general equity, uh, I think the track record for global REITs is still quite reasonable with 6.7% total return in the last uh, 10 years, and even a bit higher if you had only invested in, in REITs. A large part of that uh, performance obviously comes from the dividend yield. The dividend yield is about 4% uh, now. And whereas, whereas at the beginning of last year, a lot of people, investors worried that real estate companies would cut their dividend or would not be able to pay their dividend as tenants stopped paying. That has actually turned out not to be the case. Only in retail, we saw that uh, tenants held back on paying uh, their rents, which resulted in uh, dividend cuts in that specific sector. But in all the other sectors, tenants continue to pay their rent and companies continue to pay a dividend. We currently have a dividend yield of about 4%. The fact that most or a large part of the return from real estate comes from the dividend is actually also reflected in the lower beta, as you can see on the right hand side of the chart. So performance is, is one thing, but you obviously also own other asset classes like real estate for their diversification uh, benefits. And as you can see here on the right hand side, the diversification benefits are for listed real estate are mainly compared with bonds. On the short term, this is a two year uh, moving average. The correlation between listed real estate and equities is relatively high at 0.8, but the correlation between bonds and listed real estate is almost non-existent. So that shows that real estate is a strong uh, alternative to fixed income. You get a dividend yield, plus you get dividend growth coming from rental uh, growth. And especially at a time when, dividend, sorry, when bond yields are as low as they are, uh, I think dividend, uh, real estate dividends are a strong um, um, benefit for diversified portfolios. At the bottom, you see why we invest globally. You could obviously always buy a property, a physical property. You could always buy a REITs. But the benefits of owning a global fund are shown at the right hand at the bottom of the right, uh, at the right hand, uh, because real estate is very much a local business. So sometimes Japan will do well, sometimes the US will do well, but there are always opportunities. And diversifying your portfolio globally will give you that additional benefit as well. So performance and diversification are obviously the main benefits for of listed uh, real estate, but there are a number of others as well. Liquidity is, is one. And a lot of people sometimes argue that if you buy listed real estate, you buy equity and not so much real estate. Um, and the graph on the top will show the historic uh, uh, correlation. And although these people have a point at the short term, when correlation between REITs and equities is relatively high. And the longer term, so two years onwards, the correlation between listed real estate and physical real estate is actually quite high. So when buying listed real estate, you do buy a proxy for real estate and not just an equity. Over the last two decades, the real estate market has also grown substantially. REITs were introduced in most countries around 2000 and 2010. And as that sector has grown, 
we have also seen that the market has become more mature. You have REITs now being managed by more professional management teams. They have a better accounting and better reporting to the market. And there's also now a much wider choice of uh, REITs uh, available. Because on this la last slide, I'll, I'll show the wide um, uh, variety of REITs in the world. A lot of people sometimes assume that real estate equals retail real estate and office real estate. And although those two sectors are still a substantial part of the universe, they are only 25% of the total. And although those two sectors are struggling, as I will show a bit later, the rest of the universe actually has very strong fundamentals from residential to specialty REITs like data centers and those in the healthcare sector. So all in all, we believe that real estate does have its place, uh, its part to, to play in a diversified portfolio on the longer term. But now looking at the short term outlook for real estate, I will shortly discuss the individual uh, sectors. To start with the income oriented ones, office and retail, we've talked about office in, previous, in a previous quarterly review when we discussed the, the impacts of working from home and the counterbalance of social distancing forces. So the office sector is a bit of a question mark uh, still, what will win? Will people work from home uh, even in the new norm more? And how much of the social distancing will counterbalance that effect? Retail is still troubled. There is a continued tailwind of, um, a headwind, it should say, of online uh, shopping. And um, that has jumped up uh, in the COVID period and will probably remain so. But the fundamentals are quite strong for the industrial sector. Uh, exactly for that online shopping is obviously a tailwind for the industrial sector. Residential is steady with slow, slowly growing uh, rents and values. And the niches like data centers, tower reads and self storage. You heard about the data centers and tower and more details last, uh, last quarter. They all show very strong fundamentals. Healthcare, as mentioned, is a wide variety of uh, subsectors where we see senior housing struggling, but medical office buildings uh, showing very strong rental and value growth. We don't actually own any stocks in the lodging, timber and gaming REIT sectors, but we're obviously always on the lookout for opportunities uh, there. But the most important uh, driver for the sector as a whole is a large yield spread that we still have between dividends of the real estate sector and the bond yields. Historically, as you can see in this chart here, that yield spread has been roughly 150 to 200 basis points. It has come down since um, early 2000s, or basically after the initial COVID uh, shock, to about 310 basis points. But we do believe that that gap will narrow, that that uh, will go back to um, its historic average of 200 basis points. Now, the expectation is that gap will narrow because the two will probably move to together. We expect government bond yields in the US to go up to about a 1.5%, but that still leaves a lot of room for the dividend yields to go down. And obviously, like with bonds, if the yield goes down, that means that values have gone up. And that's why we expect roughly 8 to 12% total return for the sector as a whole, of which 4% will come from the dividend and 8% will come from uh, capital appreciation in the stocks. <clears throat> Taking a slightly closer look at, uh, at the sectors, 25%, uh, as you know, as you may know, we split up the, the, the portfolio in thematic and income. A quarter of the portfolio, slightly more than a quarter, is now in our income part of the portfolio, so office and retail. Um, office is actually, you know, the, the continued debate between working from home and uh, de-densification. Um, working from home will definitely be a, a trend that also in the new after COVID will continue. People will continue to work one, two, perhaps even three days a week 
uh, from home. So that will mean that we need less office space. On the other hand, companies have crammed more people into their offices in the last couple of decades, uh, well, since 2009, and we see that trend reversing, counterbalancing the working from home uh, trend. So that does mean that we will see more polarization between prime and secondary locations. And for us, it means that we will focus on US West Coast, um, i.e. the tech orientated cities in the US. Uh, and in Europe, we focus on, uh, on Paris. We are underway at Mid-America, uh, Asia, and the UK at the moment. For the sector as a whole, we are slightly underweight. Retail is difficult. We are structurally underweight there and we will remain so. Um, the vaccine readily, uh, as mentioned, has taken out some of that uh, extreme undervaluation in the last couple of, uh, of weeks, but the underlying fundamentals are still, uh, are still weak. Um, you see that store closures is at a new record, 15,000 stores closed in the US last year, and that will probably continue. And we see the same trend in other parts of the world. So the retail sector will struggle to keep its occupancy high. And if they don't, then obviously they will have to, uh, you will see pressure on rents and values. <clears throat> we remain on the way to sector. We have limited exposure, mainly to local shopping centers and some destination uh, malls. A thematic part of the portfolio, about three quarters of the total. Uh, first, on, uh, first on the evolving consumer, which is basically the industrial sector. Everything I said on the retail sector is in reverse for industrial. Uh, online sales have jumped up, have gapped up. They have come back uh, a, a bit uh, when the lockdown uh, lockdowns eased, but we expect that continued trend, uh, upward trends to continue slowly in the next uh, few years, or perhaps even, uh, even decades. And that does bode very well for the industrial uh, sector with e-commerce uh, growing. But it's actually not the only driver for the industrial sector. You see also that given the fact that during the, the heights of the pandemic, we saw shortages in medical supplies, but also auto parts, computer parts, etc. So a lot of companies are redefining their supply chain management and keeping on, on more supplies, i.e. needing more uh, industrial space. Industrial is also a, a, a quick moving sector. Um, you see that the, the, the new builds are very modern, uh, quite often much higher than the old buildings uh, were. Um, you see also much more automation than in the older uh, buildings. So there's a lot of potential for developers to develop new high quality uh, spec buildings. For the portfolio, it means that we will remain overweight with a focus on large cap owners of assets, but those like Prologis in the US and Goodman in Australia, uh, who also develop and run funds in managing other uh, investors' industrial assets. Urbanization, i.e. the residential sector, is a relatively boring sector, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, the sector takes up four or five percent uh, a year in, in Germany on, on values and, and rents. Um, but that's actually, you know, quite uh, uh, quite good if you can get that for the longer uh, longer term. We saw in Germany that the in Berlin the rental cap was introduced last year, so that's why the big cities are growing slightly less than the, the small cities in in Germany. But that rental cap will be discussed by um, uh, will come in front of the judges later on this year and will probably be deemed unconstitutional um, and will be abolished uh, again. <clears throat> so we remain overweight to the sector, mainly in Germany. In the US, where rent tenants are a bit more fluid, they move a bit quicker than in other parts of the world, especially in Europe. We have seen that some people are moving more to the, to the sunnier, both in weather and tax uh, states in the south. So we have moved um, uh, some of our exposure in the US from the traditional um, East and West Coast cities like New York and Boston and uh, San Francisco to more the Sun Belt states in, in Texas. <clears throat> but we remain overweight the sector as a whole. 
Uh, digitalization and uh, towers, which uh, uh, Josh talked about this extensively last uh, quarter, so I won't dwell on it now. Um, I think it's good to see that um, there is still a lot of demand. Um, demand is growing, working from home um, means that uh, a lot of companies have made the jump to becoming more agile in their uh, working, uh, outsourcing more of their IT, more, working more in the cloud, uh, all is very positive, of course, for data centers um, like uh, Acnex, which we own in, in size. The same goes for tower reads. Um, the rollout of 4 G, 5G uh, across the world will drive demand uh, uh, there. And so we remain overweight the sector with a preference for large caps like American Tower and Crown Castle. The self storage sector has traditionally been um, uh, a neutral sector for us. Uh, it still is, but we are looking to increase our exposure there because self storage proved to be very defensive in, in a COVID uh, world. Um, we were always a bit hesitant about the supply coming to the market, but a lot of that supply has been stopped in, uh, uh, in the last uh, year. Um, and you also see that a lot of students, for example, moving back to their parents um, as universities closed have used a lot of self storage space and you have seen that vacancy has dropped substantially which has put upward pressure on prices which is obviously good for self storage so we're looking to increase our rating there and finally on healthcare Alex talked about it and I talked about it already um, as mentioned senior housing is uh, struggling so we are underweight there and we are overweight the medical office building sector. So that brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. Um, I just want to end on one uh, comment. I have made some uh, references to previous presentations that we did, for example, working from home and on digitalization. Uh, obviously, should you have missed those, uh, we still have the presentations available. And should you want to have a, want to have a copy of those, please do let Malcolm or myself know and we will obviously be happy to send that uh, send that over and on that note i'll hand it back to you malcolm thank you great thank you very much ray for covering that in so much detail and thank you alex for covering the aging theme i haven't seen any questions come through on the chat i'm happy to take here's one from rowan william short hi rowan could Ray please discuss the fund's performance versus its benchmark? Ray, if you don't make, mind making a comment or two on that, please. Yes, sure. So um, obviously we, we did quite well uh, early in the year um, when we were in the more defensive uh, sectors like uh, towers, uh, data centers and residential. Fortunately, we gave back most of that relative return uh, in the last couple of weeks of the year, when we saw the reopening rally, which mostly benefited retail and to a lesser extent office place, which were very much overweight. So we lost all of the relative performance that we made earlier in the year, and then a, a slightly bit more uh, in the last couple of weeks of the, of the year. Um, however, we have not made any changes to the portfolio, no substantial changes to the portfolio, as we still believe that, uh, as mentioned, retail is structurally challenged and, and will, uh, will not be able to outperform going forward. Good. Thank you, Tony, for that, for that vote of confidence there. Ray, if I could just ask you, because I get a few questions coming through, if you could just discuss or make some comments on the currency. The fund is run as a single fund, but we have a dollar share class and a GBP share class. You know, if you want to touch on, is currency a driver for where you allocate your capital to, or do you hedge within the fund? If you can make a few comments on that, please. Yeah, so, so we um, don't hedge on a fund level, which means that if we are 55% US, then the fund will be exposed to US dollars for 55%. Uh, the, the differences in share class um, uh, is that the US dollar share class is hatched on that level. Um, so the difference between the sterling share class and the US dollar share class will be completely 
um, a result of uh, currency movements. I'm not sure if I explained that uh, <laughs> properly. Okay, no, that's fine, Ray. On that, um, from Spalding, High Spalding, I would expect to see theme-based strategy to be more defensive. Is strategy helpful or is it stock selection that will explain the returns versus benchmark? Um, it is more theme, uh, team selection. Um, and yes, we are, I think, a bit more defensive than the general market. Um, I, I think our, um, our, our beta to the, the index is 0 0.9. So we have a bit uh, more defensive names in there. Um, but I think the, uh, going forward, it's, you see that, for example, data centers are global players. Industrial uh, uh, reads are global players. So it will be more driven by the sector um, than it will be by the country. And we obviously focus on those uh, reads who have the best portfolios and the best management uh, teams and those that are sustainable in whatever, what they do. Great. Any further questions? Not at this stage, right. So just once again, thank you very much, Ray. Thank you very much, Alex, for joining us this morning. Thank you to all of you for giving up your time. I know you are inundated with requests to join webinars, Zoom meetings, and the like. So we really appreciate that. I will send out a PDF version of the presentation. And we have been recording it. So we will put the recording on our website as well. And you can revisit that should you wish to. If there's anything else you need or require on this fund or any of our other funds as well, please feel free to contact me. You are all getting my communications that go out on a weekly basis, hence your response to this invitation. So I make that assumption, but please feel free to approach me at any time. So thank you very much. Have a good day down there and take great care of yourselves as the crisis continues with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much and goodbye.